Welcome to this podcast of the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. I'm Thomas Peake and today we'll be speaking with Alex Bellamy and Stephen McLaughlin about their recent book, Rethinking Humanitarian Intervention. Alex Bellamy is the director of the Asia Pacific Centre for the Responsibility to Protect and professor in the Department of Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Queensland in Australia. Stephen McLaughlin is a senior lecturer at the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations at Coventry University. Alex and Stephen have both published widely on many issues relating to responsibility to protect and international human protection. This new book represents a succinct and yet very thoughtful rethinking of the problem of international intervention. It challenges scholars, policymakers and students to abandon outmoded understandings of humanitarian intervention which see the practice as ad hoc, provisional, and a standalone practice distinct from a broader legal and political atrocity prevention regime. So yeah, I'd just like to begin, but you you open your book by describing uh, a minor revolution in humanitarian affairs. And I wonder if you could elaborate a bit about this and, and discuss some of your book's key findings. Great. Well, Sly, I'll I'll jump in first, and then Stephen can uh, jump in to fill in all those bits that I, I either miss or don't express very very well, or get just plain wrong. So, yeah, the impetus for the book came from the sense that the politics of humanitarian intervention had, had gone through a significant change, and that we needed to place humanitarian intervention. So, by that we mean you know armed intervention against the will of the state involved within the context of a set of broader changes that have been occurring in humanitarian politics. And that too too often kind of in IR, we tend to kind of isolate the question of armed intervention from everything else. And this gives a number of false impressions. Um, It gives the false impression that humanitarian intervention is something that happens quite frequently after the 1990s. And our sense is when you look across the range, the full range of cases involving genocide and mass atrocities, Armed um, humanitarian intervention is actually quite rare and still is quite rare. And the second misconception is um, that the choices that policymakers face is one between intervening with force or doing nothing at all. And in practice, most of the time, the policy options sit somewhere between those two, two variables. And those are where um, the key options are. And those are the key options that states and the UN usually follow. And yet the key changes in those policies that have gone on in the last 30 years haven't really been taken into account in the debate on humanitarian intervention. So just two examples on that um, that I always kind of ram home with my my students. So we all know about the UN's mission in Bosnia and that the UN's um, peacekeeping mission there was called UNPROFOR, the UN Protection Force. Yet UNPROFOR didn't have a mandate to protect civilians in Bosnia. In fact, not until 2001 did any UN peace operation have a specific mandate to protect civilians. Yet in the last 20 years, we've gone from there being no protection of civilians mandates to protection of civilians mandates being par for the course for UN peace missions, that all UN peace missions, new UN peace missions have these mandates. So there's been a kind of a seismic shift in in the use of peacekeeping for protection of civilians. And then if you look at a whole range of other sorts of activities from preventive diplomacy to early warning to the use of economic measures, you see a similar um, seismic shift away from a kind of ad hoc piecemeal sort of approach where humanitarian issues are siphoned off from human rights, from politics, from diplomacy, towards an approach where states more and more see these things as being interlinked and are more and more aware of the different policy levers they have and are more engaged. So, you know, we talk about um, to, to kind of wrap up, we talk about Syria as the kind of great cataclysm of inaction. But if we compare Syria, say, with Cambodia in the 1970s, the international response is, is night and day. So in Cambodia, the Security Council didn't meet once to debate uh, what was happening in Cambodia in, in the late 70s. Not even the Human Rights Commission had a meeting to discuss what the Khmer Rouge was doing. Now, on Syria, you have a hotly politically contested issue right in the center of a key geopolitical fault line. Yet you have dozens of UN Security Council resolutions, not all of them just the kind of usual meaningless jargon. You had you had a UN mission of monitors deployed. You had UN resolutions to disarm Syria of its chemical weapons. You had 
landmark UN Security Council resolution authorizing the delivery of humanitarian aid without the consent of the host state, something the council had never done before. And so not saying that those solved the problem or were effective or or, or did the trick, but it's a sign of a, a, a change, a, a major change in humanitarian politics that just focusing on humanitarian intervention alone doesn't doesn't explain for you. Yeah, I think you've pretty much covered that, Alex. What I would add is that because of these uh, significant changes, particularly over the last 20 years in terms of building a whole range of strategies and practices that that make human protection more robust and is reflective of the, uh, the greater international commitment towards the protection practices, when we talk about humanitarian intervention, we need to understand it within that broader context. We need to understand it within uh, within a broader spectrum of, of protection practices and initiatives and strategies, most of which are, uh, are non-coercive and in character. And uh, so uh, this, this goes back to your initial point, Tom, that quite often humanitarian intervention, particularly today within a lot of scholarly debates, uh, is still seen as a standalone practice and is still uh, discussed and debated as a standalone practice when actually, in fact, it's, it's one practice uh, among a broad spectrum of practices. And if we really want to understand the nature of humanitarian intervention, we need to understand it as a, a rarely deployed strategy within a broader range of, uh, of prevention and protective practices that international society has been has been um, engaging in and, and using. Thank you. That was a, that was a really in, in, in interesting description of this kind of moment we're in. And, and, and something that struck me when, when reading your book, and um, which is very different to, to, to most scholarship in humanitarian intervention or around humanitarian intervention, was that it was relatively hopeful and, and almost kind of optimistic about progress made over over recent decades and and also in in, in looking to the future and this this might strike re- some readers as, as as being quite unexpected given kind of the very real and still seemingly intractable crises which we have in very different contexts so just to take two examples for example to, to look at the drc or, or what's happening in china is, is this a case of how do you measure successful prevention in essence I think uh, it's always difficult to measure successful prevention because you, you, you're trying to put your finger on something that doesn't happen. And so you're always going to pinpoint more easily the failures of prevention and the, the perpetration uh, cases where atrocities are being perpetrated. And uh, the cases where uh, human protection is successful or human protection has had some effectiveness in, in, in the face of uh, risk in relation to mass atrocities, that's a lot more difficult to talk about and it's a lot more difficult to measure. So one of the things we do in the book is we look at some of these big picture measurements, you know, the, the rate of violence, uh, the instance of civil wars and perpetration of atrocities over a long period of time as, as one proxy. But, but again, it's, it's difficult to precisely measure the success of human protection for that very purpose is that you're trying to track a non-event. There are other ways of uh of of trying to take account of that and, um there are there are frameworks where you can sort of un- you could look at uh various uh levels of risk and how risk uh how uh, strategies and and processes that mitigate risk become become more robust and become um become more evident but again, it, it doesn't eliminate that one of those uh, those key dilemmas in this area is that uh, it's really difficult to actually account for things that don't happen. That doesn't diminish the fact that uh, there are a lot of uh, cases around the world where tragically atrocities are still occurring. In some cases, they're escalating, and um, and and so so it, it's all about trying to get better at the process of risk management, management and risk mitigation, and and sort of situating where international society fits into those processes. A lot of that success, a lot of the effectiveness of, of prevention will come from domestic actors, but there's a, there's a role to play for international society as well. As ever, Stephen's uh, explained it much better than I could. Just a kind of couple of ki- um, very quick points. One is in, you know, in this field where, when you're studying humanitarian crises and responses to crises, there's always a sense of crisis. I mean, the, 
I can't think of a time when there wasn't a crisis with international humanitarian law or, or with atrocities or prevention or intervention. It's sort of the nature of the beast is that there is always a sense of, of a crisis. And I think one of the sources of our optimism is, if I could put it a bit tongue in cheek, is that we easily forget how bad things used to be. You know, we talk a lot about the, you know, the long piece of the Cold War, but for most of the world, the Cold War wasn't a long piece at all. It was nasty, bloody, bitter and full of unbridled violence and, and civil wars that far surpassed some of the civil wars we've seen in the last um, sort of couple of decades. The third thing is, you know, you can, if you take a kind of a long-term perspective, you can still see underlying underlying change. Now, change doesn't always go in one direction, but I think one of the things that R2P has done really effectively is change our expectations. So if you take a, you take some stats for the uh, the peak of, of, of the recent crises in uh, humanitarian emergencies in terms of displacement and civilians killed, which is about 2014-2015, when the peak of the Syria war and the rise of ISIS. Well, the total number of civilians being killed that year, when we had a kind of real sense that the world was falling apart, you know, that um, you know, crisis upon crisis was being heaped upon us, the total number of civilians being killed that year was about the same as it was 10 years earlier. When back in you know, 2004, 2005, we were focused on Darfur and other crises, but no one had the sense of things kind of collapsing or, or order collapsing around their ears. And that number was still well below the figure of civilians being killed 10 years before in 1994, 95. And I think one of the things that's happened and one of the things that R2P has been most successful at is shaping our expectations. We now have part, one of the reasons why we have a, clearer sense that there's a crisis today is because we expect so much more today than we did 10, 20 or 30 years ago. The other thing is we're looking at um, a wicked problems. I mean, if you go back to 2010, 2011 and close your eyes and put your finger on the map of the world in places where you really don't want humanitarian crises to erupt because the geopolitics of it are going to be so difficult, the chances of getting the council on board into unified action are close to zero, you'd put your finger somewhere near Damascus, probably. And of course, you know, one of the features of the last 10 years is that so many of the humanitarian crises have been driven by the Arab Spring and then the difficult geopolitics that that, that has unleashed. And finally, because you mentioned the DRC, what's interesting in the DRC, there's two kind of interesting points. I know there's that famous uh, Obama quote about how do you weigh up lives, 10,000 deaths in Syria with 10,000 deaths in the DRC. And that's in some way a misnomer, because when Obama was talking, tens of thousands of people in the DRC weren't being killed. Ten years before that, they were. But at the time Obama was talking, they weren't because you had Monusco and a fragile peace process and things being held together. In fact, rates of violent death in the DRC were lower than in Mexico. Still, you'd have up outbursts of violence, but overall rates were lower than in other parts of the country, other parts of the world because a fragile peace and some basic protection is being provided imperfectly by MONUSCO. But what that's presented is the kind of the new challenge that the UN is facing, that as these, all these peace operations have shifted from a focus on conflict resolution towards a focus on protection of civilians, you now have a whole series of missions that are holding some basic modicum of protection in place, such that if it was removed tomorrow, most people expect that you'd get spikes of violence. But it's proving very, very difficult then to advance the political process towards some sort of exit strategy. So in the DRC, in Mali, slightly differently, in the Central African Republic, in South Sudan, and still Darfur to some extent, we've got these new problems where on the one hand, the peace operations have gotten much better at protecting civilians. And there is now a large body of both quantitative and qualitative work using different data sets that confirm that the deployment of peacekeepers diminishes civilian victimization. And the more peacekeepers you have, the greater that effect. But that's created this new problem, which is how do you then move these missions from a, um, out of the country? How do you then transition these societies into conditions where you, um, you don't need peacekeepers protecting civilians anymore? And that's now one of the kind of the key issues um, facing the sector, which is a problem created in part by the partial success of peacekeeping at protecting civilians. Thank you, and this this is this is this is really interesting, and and it, it speaks to something a, 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 a related theme in your book, which I found uh, very insightful that the, the the success of humanitarian intervention 
as a as a kind of a, a, a practice in international politics perhaps shouldn't be measured by um, the number of legitimate military you know interventions uh, on the kind of the Sierra Leone kind of model but but rather the embeddedness of it as a as a kind of practice within these broader these these broader measures but there still do remain very specific issues related to the almost you know or, or, or which are indistinguishable from the ad hoc understanding of humanitarian intervention and and there might still be be instances when when this this more kind of extraordinary ad hoc approach is is, is perhaps required or demanded or, or or expected at least from the, from the people on the ground and so i wonder is this is this new way of kind of viewing the the plate the kind of almost the, the, the institutional role of humanitarian intervention in, in the international order is is it more than kind of a discursive kind of threat than a an expectation of regular or kind of reliable, kind of for unconsensual, forcible interventions. So the first point would be, yeah, everything other than non-consensual force, of course, requires consent, and that's a a big block. Now we know, and um, uh, we know there are things that can be done to try to um, induce consent. So, for example, if we go back to Timor the end of the 90s, we can see the use of fin strong financial pressure on the government of Indonesia to relent and consent to a peace operation. You can see similar things uh, being used periodically on governments in the DRC in South Sudan. But what we also see is that against kind of committed authoritarians, usually who are set on a path of using force uh, to secure victory, there's a limit to what you can do consensually. And so these issues of non-consensual force are going to come up uh, again and again. And of course, R2P tried to um, strike a bargain and the bargain was, let's focus on doing all of those things that we can do consensually in the hope that that reduces the number of times we have to face this decision of whether or not to act non-consensually. In return for that, let's assume that we can find consensus in those smaller numbers of cases. So in other words, the West was giving up the focus on military humanitarianism and saying, yep, let's focus on other steps. Let's put effort into peacekeeping. Let's develop doctrine. But in return, and also I should say, let's run all this through the UN Security Council, which was a key thing that the Chinese in particular wanted. That's one of the reasons why they signed on to R2P. They were worried about the West pursuing humanitarian goals outside of the UN. So they said, well, we'll do that. We'll bring it into the UN. But in return, the expectation is, China and others sign up to R2P and sign up to the idea that sometimes they're going to have to say yes to non-consensual intervention because there's no way in which they can fulfill the responsibilities that they themselves have committed to without non-consensual intervention. And of course, this was what people were talking about when they were talking about the Libya moment around 1973, the moment at which China and Russia actually did abstain to a Security Council resolution that authorized the use of force very, very broadly to protect civilians. Um, there was, and as I wrote at the time, and I think we write in the book, there were all sorts of exceptional reasons why it was possible in that case, not least among them the fact that everybody disliked Gaddafi, including, including the Russians, because Gaddafi had been supporting anti-Russian groups in the Caucasus. And so there were all sorts of political reasons why that was possible. But that was the sort of the bargain that people had in mind. And of course, once what we've seen post Libya is that that bargain has started to erode and it started to erode in, on both sides. I think as a result of the global financial crisis, we, and then the rise of populism to some extent in the West, we saw the West backing away from things like peacekeeping, from things like promoting always international humanitarian law, um, from investing in core capacities such as, you know, the UN's preventive diplomacy. And of course, particularly once uh, Vladimir Putin returned to the Kremlin, we saw the Russians and Chinese pushing back harder. And it's, but it's important to stress that the Russian and Chinese pushback is not just or even primarily against R2P or humanitarian interventionism. It's against the whole of the, the human rights agenda. You know, they've, they've gone after 
the peace building architecture. They've gone after the peacekeeping architecture. They've really gone after the human rights architecture. In fact, if you if you wrote a kind of comparative history of the R2 of R2P and the ICC, you see that R2P has gotten off far lighter than the ICC has when we're talking about that that backlash. So we we we, we reach again this kind of impasse of what to what to do in these situations of non consensual armed force. But that's been avoided thus far because one of the other things that's happened as a result of the trends I just mentioned is that it hasn't come up because no one in the West has proposed humanitarian intervention either. And again, I think this is one of the things we're trying to convey in the book. Is that a lot of the literature imagines that the world is full of liberal democracies itching to spend resources and commit troops to foreign adventures to save strangers. When that's not the case at all. Most governments are deeply hostile to doing this sort of thing and do it only if they're very confident that the likelihood of success is great and the likelihood of costs. Um, so that issue hasn't come up because nobody has proposed a humanitarian intervention. And then my final, final, final point, um, which is again to, to somewhat dodge the issue of non-consensual intervention to some extent, but not totally, is that beneath the surface with the politics of R2P has been a, a transformation of politics in, in one particular region that has largely gone unnoticed in, in the Western literature, which is sub-Saharan Africa, where you actually have a fairly strong developing tradition of interventionism, sometimes collective through the AU and ECOWAS, sometimes bilateral by powerful states like Nigeria and South Africa. You've got a very different set of political responses to those sorts of interventions. So we see nothing like the sort of backlash to intervention in, say, the Gambia or Cote d'Ivoire that we see when, when, when other states do it in other parts of the world. And so you see, and you also see the development of regional capacities as well, both hard boiled into the AU constitution, but also in the AU's mission in Somalia and the development of African standing capacities for, for intervention, should it be needed. Now, of course, we still see, get, see all the difficult politics and sometimes the AU doesn't run as quickly uh, as some would like, and sometimes it, it, it backpedals. But if you kind of take a step back and look at a multi-decade trajectory, again, there is no doubting the shifts in the institutional and normative architecture that have gone on um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think that's the sort of, those are the sorts of long-term shifts that we're looking for with this book. It's a kind of a, if only the rest of the world could start thinking of doing things as the African Union and sub, um, sub-regional organizations in Africa have started thinking about doing this then we could see some of those transformational changes happening in other parts of the world as well. Now, of course, it just so happens, to, to, to really finish this time, that the, big, the largest crises we have right now are also in those parts of the world that have the least institutional development at the regional level. So the Middle East and Southeast Asia, two places that have been intentionally under-institutionalized um, in that regard. And of course, that just exacerbates the problems and difficulties. Well, just to just to pick up on one point there, I mean, the, the thing, yeah, to, to enter this question about, you know, the, the, the existence of a humanitarian adventure as a possible discursive or, or actual threat, the African Union and ECOWAS immediately came to mind as well. So I'd just like to sort of emphasize that too. I mean, if you look at um, the threat of uh, ECOWAS troops along the borders of uh, the Gambia in 2017, when there was a, a reluctance for a... a um, a, a democratically mandated regime change, or if you look at the uh, the intervention in uh, the military intervention in Comoros Islands in t- 2008 to remove a um, a leader who uh, came to power through military coup in order to again sort of uh, backing up the uh, the normative commitments in the in the AU Charter around non indifference and um, uh, around yeah civilian protection and accountability. You see, uh, you see. The African Union and ECOWAS really coming to the fore in terms of of actually keeping hum- uh, military intervention as a as a as a real option in terms of uh, of maintaining uh, democratic norms. Thank you. I'd I'd like to now ask you a little bit about um, the kind of uh, uh, historical approach, which is a which is certainly a theme um, in your book. Here at the Centre for Geopolitics, we've got a strong focus on applied history uh, as, as a methodology and as a kind of a, a, a learning tool for, um, uh, for, for for contemporary politics. 
Um, but given the, the the kind of the global nature of of the international humanitarian regime and, and all the different kind of contexts which are encountered and which can often be reduced in 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 accounts about how humanitarian interventions kind of shorthand um anecdotes like for example you know vietnam um in cambodia or tanzania in in uganda or rwanda as non-intervention um, whereas these these are these are potentially much more complex than the way they're presented in the literature i, I wonder um how or in what way you find the study of 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 kind of historically proclaimed humanitarian interventions or or uh, you know historical examples of of non-intervention which are which are condemned i wonder how how you find these useful to constructing ideas that might be relevant to what we should do now the historical cases of intervention sort of uh, illuminate a couple of uh interesting sort of shifts and uh, firstly um when you look at intervention historically you see you see uh, i guess a couple of patterns number one i mean intervention historically interventions historically uh further into the past uh were usually bilateral uh in nature uh humanitarian interventions were that did have some success in in stopping atrocities and stopping genocides were were usually roundly condemned. We talked about the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia and the invasion of of Cambodia by Vietnam, uh, which was roundly condemned by uh, the international community at the time for violating Cambodian sovereignty. You had a similar situation in the early nineteen seventies in um, East Pakistan, Bangladesh, when when uh, the Indian Army intervened to uh, to stop atrocities uh, there, you know, uh, amounting into the millions. And again, uh, it was uh, Cold War realpolitik that determined uh, the, the international response to that, condemning India for violating Pakistani sovereignty. Uh, later on in the decade, uh, with the intervention uh, by the Tanzanian government into Uganda to... Um, to uh, confront the um, the violence of the Idi Amin regime, you pretty much had uh, very little response from the international community at all. There was no credit given to uh, the the new era regime in um, in Tanzania for for stopping the atrocities and for removing Idi Amin from power, and there was no material support given uh, given to this. And um, you know, bear in mind, at the time, Tanzania was one of was one of the world's poorest countries who could, who could little afford a, an expensive military intervention in Uganda, and uh, and and uh, their reward was to be given absolutely, you know, no resources in order to carry that out. So um, you see this evolution, the shift uh, on the one hand from moving away from bilateral interventions uh, towards greater international consensus when when interventions have been carried out and. Uh, and uh, you also see this sort of shift in rhetoric and shift in responses. Yeah, good answer, Steve, and thanks, Tom. There are th uh, kind of a number of things that have really kind of struck me o over the years has been really crucial when you apply this method. And I think this method is absolutely crucial because I think when we don't apply it, we make all sorts of false assumptions and run to all sorts of, 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 of wrong judgments. And I find that often in it, you know, you find that what the international relations literature says about a particular case, it can be quite different to what the specialist literature says. And that's because often in international relations, we're glancing over things very quickly. So the first thing that I've kind of noticed is that when you're talking about humanitarian intervention in particular, it's, it's, it's difficult to pull it off. It's, it's difficult to get the, your, the domestic politics in the intervening country lined up, the international politics lined up. So, of course, governments are going to be operating with mixed motives because the risks and costs to them are always so high and the payoffs are always so limited. This is how I, I, I always explain it to my, my students. You know, we do the kind of the week on Rwanda and everyone condemns Bill Clinton for dropping the ball. But then I say to them, you know, how many people who would have voted Democrat at the next election switched to vote Republican because Clinton didn't intervene in Rwanda? The answer is probably somewhere around zero. But how many would have made that switch had the U.S. intervened and it had gone wrong and American soldiers had start, started coming back in body bags or, you know, the situation had spiraled further? And the answer is, well, possibly quite a few. So the, the domestic politics of intervening states is often stacked up against intervention. 
it's it's you avoid all sorts of responsibility by not intervening so it's 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 those it's not surprising that these are exceptional and rare cases what's the one lesson that every european state learned by the mess that the dutch got themselves into in srebrenica don't send your peacekeepers to places like srebrenica it's going to end up being awkward for you nobody else has faced the sort of angst that the Dutch has faced because everybody else knowing the risks that were there in Srebrenica decided to keep their peacekeepers away. The second thing I've kind of learned is that again, we in international relations tend to massively over-exaggerate the impact of international factors on the unfolding of crises within particular countries. So actors engaged in civil wars or thinking about civil wars or prosecuting civil wars are much more driven by judgments about what's going to work politically within their country or within their immediate region than they are by what's going to happen at the Security Council or what politics in the UK or the US is going to be. Those do factor in at some critical moments, but the day-to-day workings out of, of civil war, of insurgency and counterinsurgency, of arming and disarming, these are very much driven by um, by local and domestic concerns, and we seriously overestimate international influence. And, and that what that means is we think that you know small amounts of leverage can produce dramatic effects on the ground, and it, and it rarely does. Which is exactly why we often come back to this issue of non consensual intervention, because ultimately, um, where you've got really committed actors on but one or both of the sides only really serious international action is going to change their calculation. Because often those actors have already factored in that the international community isn't going to like them for a while. I mean, we saw you know, Sri Lanka in 2009 really kind of set the model that you've seen kind of everyone since follow, which is do what you want to do with maximum force, expect you're going to get international criticism for a while, but after a couple of years, most of that criticism will die down and after kind of five or six years, some of those sanctions will start getting lifted and trade will kick up again. And you'll have paid a bit of a cost, but you'll have achieved what you wanted to achieve by committing atrocity crimes. I think the Sri Lankans there set, set a playbook. Um, the, f- um, the third thing that I think really matters, and when you look at the history and that, that our theories often don't take good account of, is agency. That agency matters. As soon as you get into the weeds of any particular case, you'll find that actors, there were decision moments where actors took particular decisions that could have gone the other way. And these include actors that end up being perpetrators. So, for example, you know, June 2011, Bashar al-Assad is giving his first televised address during the crisis. Instead of calling the protesters foreign-backed terrorists, he could have said, I'm with you, I'm a reformist, let's do this together perfectly plausible. Most Syrians at that point still thought he was a reformer. There's some stories that say he actually had that version of his speech written up as well. Had he given that speech, everything that happened afterwards um, would have been different. And although there were, you know, there were structural pressures pushing him in particular directions, it's not predetermined. And you see that, you know, again and again and again. When you take the historical perspective, you do learn a certain caution about trying to draw kind of lessons and trends um, across multiple cases or reading too much. You can kind of see broad patterns, but you learn not to read too much into those patterns because you understand that the things that are producing those patterns are so contingent and so full of agency that, that it's very, very difficult. And when you're talking in particular about humanitarian intervention, you also discover that it needs leadership and it needs someone who's prepared to take risk. Where leaders are risk averse, you're never going to get the sort of intervention that you see in a, you saw in, a, say, a Sierra Leone or a Kosovo or even a Cote d'Ivoire in 2011. Because as soon as you take the military option, you know, friction means that you can never be certain what the outcome is going to be. You can never be certain what forces you're about to unleash. And the way we've constructed our kind of global politics of humanitarianism is that for a political leader, especially in a democracy, Humanitarian action in other countries is all risk and, and almost zero reward. So there's no surprise that you, you move to a place where, where governments become more risk averse. Thank you. And that was a, a, re- a really interesting point um, to end on, I think. Thank you very much, uh, 
Stephen and Alex. It's been a it's been a wonderful discussion. Thanks, Tom. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to this podcast on genocide and mass atrocity prevention and the responsibility to protect. You can find the Centre for Geopolitics on Twitter at Camp Geopolitics. All of our events are advertised on our website at cfg.polis.cam.ac.uk.